All right, Matthew chapter 23, are you there? So, uh, we're, we're, we, we've really been talking, I'm just trying to kind of bring this back because of time now. Uh, have you ever heard of the name, and I imagine you have, Matt Emmons? Matt Emmons uh, was uh, an Olympian representing the United States, and he's been into the Olympics in 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016, and he's won all kinds of awards in the rifle competition. And uh, maybe you've heard of him because he's known for what he missed and not for what he hit, though you can see from the awards he hit a lot. Um, from a child, he's won all type of awards until even uh, the latest Olympics in 16. Uh, he's won, uh, specifically in the Olympics, he's won some gold, silver, and bronze. Of course, he's wearing that in the picture. But again, he's known for what he missed, some might say missed, and not what he won. Here's the deal, I'm going to read it. These are the facts of what happened in 2004 in the finals of the competition, the 50-meter three-position rifle event. Listen to this. He was one shot, Matt was one shot away from claiming victory in the 2004 Olympics. He was competing in the 50-meter three-position rifle event. He didn't even need a bullseye to win. His final shot merely needed to be on target. That'd be me. I could, you know, barely hit the target, and so... uh, all he needed just was to hit the target. That's all he needed to do. He didn't need some bullseye, which he could probably do most of the time. He just needed to hit the target. But what was described, but what was described as an extremely rare mistake in elite competition, Matt, Matt fired at the wrong target. So if you watch it on video, it's, it's pretty crazy. Like literally what was in front of him, he shot to the next target. He was just confused in that moment. And what would have been a great score, and he just would have won the whole thing and got the gold, his score shot at the wrong target was a zero, and so he ended up in eighth place. This was the picture they took right after, have people know that is an embarrassing moment right there. Anybody ever missed the target before, and I'm not talking about rifle practice? We've all missed the target before. I just want to talk to you a little bit about this morning, and we'll continue that thought in a second parter. Right here on your screen, a lot of fans today, we're talking about not a fan, a lot of fans today would tell you they're following Jesus, but they're really following a set of religious rules and rituals. They have confused the targets. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, in this few moments we have here together to dive into your word, would you help me speak? Would you silence the noise of the world and all the business and the craziness of our own lives so we can hear your voice clearly? And God, I pray once again, let it not be a man just speaking, but let your spirit speak through me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We've got to recognize and understand this whole thing, this, the whole thing about being a follower versus a fan. Jesus never called us to be fans, he called us to be followers of himself. Uh, And and I think if you've missed any of these series, go online, they're there, I don't want to take the time to review, but the main point of this whole six-week series is, what does it really mean and what does it really look like to be a completely committed follower of Jesus Christ? Not a fan. We all know what fans are like, but a follower. Somebody say follower. And so that's that's what God has called us to be, and I think What happens, especially if you've grown up in church like myself, and I know that many in this room have not, and many have, that you can find in yourself over time that you can get religious and not even know it. And that's what I want to talk to you about, religiosity. And I want to tell you, this is probably not going to be the easiest message to dive into today and the second parter, because this comes from Matthew 23, which was not a really great, it was not a kumbaya moment with Jesus and the religious leaders. Jesus didn't get all the guys around and say, hey, we're just going to, somebody get the campfire going, bring out the s'mores. I just want to encourage y'all. No, that did not happen. And if you've been with me on this series, we've, we've talked about some conversations that became encounters. Because by the way, when you have a conversation with the king of kings, it's going to become an encounter. Hello. All right, we've talked about conversations. Last week, I talked about Jesus talking to the crowd. Today, Jesus talks to the religious leaders, but he starts off the conversation 
talking to the crowd and his disciples, and then somewhere along the way he turns it and speaks specifically to the religious leaders. Now, this is a long chapter. I'm not going to read it all. I'm going to focus on some scriptures real quick, but I want to kind of set the premise here. Uh, Jesus is not a fan. I was about to say was, but it's is. He is still. Jesus is not a fan of religion. I want to say that again. Jesus is not a fan of religion. Somebody's like, well, what what are we sitting here for? Christianity is not based, or even, I don't even like to be called a religion, though I know in the history books that's what they'll call it. Christianity is centered around a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? It's not around a bunch of rules and regulations and requirements, though we do have the Ten Commandments, though we do have the law. We know that Jesus came and fulfilled the law, all right? And he came so we could have relationship with our Papa, with our Father, who's up in heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven. So we're not negating the Ten Commandments. We're not saying that there shouldn't be laws. Can you imagine our country without laws? That's kind of where it's going, by the way. It's crazy. Without law, there's chaos. So thank God for laws, the laws of the land and the laws of our God. But... A lot of times what happens to Christians, especially if you've been in it for a while, you can get religious and you can start to play church instead of being church. And Jesus didn't like that. He sniffed it out real quick. I mean, he just knew. And so this big crowd, as I addressed last week, there was always a big crowd around Jesus. This big crowd of people had a lot of religious leaders in it. And Jesus turns to them. And it has a conversation. Look at it with me. Matthew chapter 23. Start at verse 1. We're going to end at verse 5 just because of time. And he says this. Then Jesus said to the crowd. So look who he's. There's a big, huge crowd. Then Jesus said to the crowd and his disciples, The teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees are the officials interpreters of the law of Moses. Now let me just pause for a second. Every religious leader in that crowd was like, Finally, he has recognized us. I mean, they're like, it is good that the carpenter's son has seen the light. I mean, can you see it? They're getting real proud. Because look, look, look what Jesus says. They don't even know what Jesus is about to say. He's, Jesus says, I want to read it just so you get this. Then Jesus said to the crown disciples, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees and the offic- are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. But he didn't stop there. Look at this. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. And they're just kind of like, mm, you know, they're just in the crowd like, I am, not where, I am not here right now. He says, so practice and obey what they tell you, but don't follow. Somebody say follow. Don't follow their example. For they don't practice what they teach. Or they don't practice what they preach. Chris Frith translation. They crush people with their unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. And this is where I'm going to stop, 5A. Everything they do is for, in bolded here, show. Everything they do is for, say it with me. Now listen, I just said, this, right, this is hard conversation Jesus is having with them. You read it and we can kind of chuckle and laugh about it. But Jesus is speaking it to us today also. This was to the religious leaders of that day, but he's speaking to us and saying, Hey guys. I'm not focused about what's going on on the outside. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I want your heart. And he knew that religious leaders, and so he goes off, I'm going to read a couple of these. Some people, theologians, call this chapter the woe chapter. It's a sermon of woes because Jesus is about to just throw down some stuff. And and I think a lot of people, even believers, confuse Jesus with Mr. Rogers. Y'all remember Mr. Rogers? I loved Mr. Rogers growing up. Going to see him in heaven one day. And uh, he was a good Presbyterian brother. And Mr. Rogers, won't you please, please won't you be my neighbor? Some kids in here are like, what the heck are we talking about? <laughs> Sorry, it was another generation. but And he just loved children. And, you know, he, he was just so kind and, and nice. And he had more sweater vests than anybody in the entire world. He had more shoes than anybody did way before Air Jordans were out. He was the man when it came with shoes. But I think a lot of times as Christians, we confuse 
Jesus, and because a lot of people, especially uh, this beautiful next generation coming up, they all they focus on is Jesus' is love. God is love. He's my friend, and He is love. And He is your friend. While we were yet enemies, uh, Christ died for us. We, we were aliens. We were strangers, and He called us friends. He is all those things, but He's also so much more. Jesus is the righteous judge. You don't hear that talked about. He is the lover of your soul, and He is a friend. Greater love hath no man than this, than he that lay down his life for his friends. That's talking about twofold, Jesus and the way that we should be with friends. So He will do that. He is the great friend. But He is also a righteous judge. And you don't, you don't hear that talked about a lot. He, he's, he's not just Mr. Rogers. you know. And, and the thing about it here, He's telling these guys, because He knew what the religious leaders were doing. Listen to me. The religious leaders were taking a good thing, the law, and they were throwing even more on it to make it impossible for the people to be able to meet it. They were like, you know what? We got these Ten Commandments. Well, we're going to throw all these things on there to make it almost impossible, and we're going to make ourselves look like we have all the answers. But Jesus nailed them, not even knowing them. He just nailed them. He said, you're making people make it impossible to get into heaven. You're not going to go there, and you're making impossible people to go there. He's like, you're making it so hard. And, he's, and then he says, you know what? You're not even doing what you're telling people to do. Jesus was like, I'm tired of it. You ever, as a parent, you've been like, enough. Jesus was doing that. As a parent, he's like, you know, this is the father through Jesus, the son. He's like, that's it. You're killing people. Can I tell you what? Religion kills people. Relationship with Jesus heals people. There's a big difference. And too many people have walked away from church because they were stuck in religion and they had lost the whole factor of what Christianity is about. Relationship. And let me tell you what. It can happen to the best of us. I've seen it firsthand. Because of religion. And here, here's what happens. The people, you hear a lot. You hear it from friends. We have friends. I'll never go to church again. I hate church. This, this, this. And when you drill down, it's associated to two things. Number one, pain. And number two, religion. And that is the ploy and the plan of the evil one. The enemy would laugh and love for you and I just to get really religious. And let, let this, he would love for the church, capital C, to become just a religious, historical thing. Not a live, organic, moving, breathing. That's what the church is. Entity. He calls us the bride of Christ. These law, these religious leaders, they, listen to me, they were performance-oriented. They always focused on appearance. They loved titles. They loved public recognition. That's why Jesus got a zinger. He's like, hey, these guys, they are the interpreters of the law. And they're all like, yes, we are. And then he said, don't listen to them. <laughs> don't listen to them. Now, we, we look at that and we go, them, them bad religious leaders, they're just bad. But Jesus is also talking to us today. And you might be like, well, I'm not a religious leader. That's your job, Pastor Chris, and the elders and the, you know, and the staff. No, we're all, Jesus is speaking to all of us because religion can creep into any of us. He called it, the, the, theologians call it the woe to you chapter. It's the, the sermon of the woes. He said woe seven times. Look on your screen. Look down in your verse, uh, Matthew 23, 13. This is when he turns the conversation from the crowd to the religious leaders. Look at this. He says, woe to you. Teachers of the law and the Pharisees, look at this. He says, you hypocrites. And by the way, he didn't say it like this. You hypocrites. <laughs> he was ticked. People don't like to think about it in this way. And, and a lot of people, I was reading up on this all week. This is a, a, a passage of scripture that is not preached a lot in church today because people don't like to think of Jesus being ticked off. Anybody remember when he was in the temple? Somebody's like, uh, you know, uh, if, if you're here and you don't know, you're like, yeah, Jesus went to the temple all the time. Yes, he did. But one time he went to the temple, his father's house, and uh, he wasn't so happy. This was not a kumbaya moment. 
I mean, he was turning over tables because they were selling stuff in the house where it should be prayer and worship going on, and the word being read. They're selling all kind of animals and everything else. And I mean, he's turning, and he had a righteous anger. If you're going to have anger, have a righteous anger. All the religious crowd, what is he doing? And he was like, my house shall be called a house of prayer as he's turning over tables. And this is coming to me right now. I think the Lord needs to turn over some tables in our lives where maybe we've gotten a little, dare I to say it, religious. He says, you hypocrites, look at this, you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. I looked up the word woe, because we've all had the woe is me moments. Woe is me. That woe there is twofold meaning. It's grief and heartbreak. So Jesus' heart is grieved. By the way, did Jesus love the religious leaders? Yes, he did. He loved them enough to correct them. Principal Lee just said that on the video. He said, a lot of people don't like that I'm a disciplinarian. I have tell my children, and I've always told the students all through the years that I was a youth pastor, I- I'm, I'm going to call you out because I love you. I was called out from people who loved me. Love corrects. It does, doesn't just, oh, you're going to be okay. Love also corrects and disciplines. The Father even tells us if we're not disciplined, we're called illegitimate children, Hebrews tells us. So th- aren't you glad that the Father loves us enough to call us on the carpet? I'm telling you, yesterday as I was typing this message out, Saturday's my type and pray day, I was repenting almost all day because I'm like, this is a hard message just for me. Because the Lord was showing some religiosity in me. It's just so easy to get in there, even if it's just a seed of religion. Jesus, right here on the screen, next thought here. Jesus strongly opposed the religious leaders, listen to me, because he didn't want the people confused with following the rules than following him. See, fans fans focus on appearance. So Jesus is having this spirited talk with the crowd, and then he turns to the religious leaders, and the first thing he says, like insult after major insult, you're a hypocrite. And Jesus knew what he was saying. Have you ever been angry and things are just flying out of your mouth, you had no idea what you were saying? Okay, I'm one of the few in the room, but you know, you're just ticked off and it's just it's just flying out of you. you I mean, you're making up words in that moment, you know. Ah, you know, and then you walk away from like, what did I just say? You know, Father, forgive me for my anger. And you know, you're not cursing, you just literally were just you're just starting to argue about things, you don't even know what you're saying. You're just trying to win the point. Jesus knew exactly what he was saying. He was calling these religious leaders hypocrites. And I, I looked it up because I wanted to know, and I got Lisa uh, yesterday did a little honeydew errand for me as I was studying, and bought these masks. And, and, and this is, stay with me on this in the last few moments here. And the thing about hypocrite, it comes from the Greek classical theater. Some of you know this. Greek actors in ancient Greece were called hypocrites. All right? And often what would happen was a, a single actor would play, se- one single actor would play several different characters, and for each character the actor would play, they would use a different mask. And so the one person would be doing this and come out, and, and then they would go back and disappear, and, and then they would have another mask on. The same person, but different mask. And, and then they, they'd come back out. They'd do three or four, uh, four or five. I, I noticed this was a weird one, honey. Thanks a lot. But, uh, you know, just, just different mask. We'll get rid of that one. Somebody say mask. You're getting the parallel. Jesus, he was calling them, you're an actor. He was calling the religious leaders, you're a bunch of actors. You're telling people what to do, but you're not living it yourself. You're doing everything going through the motions, but it's not coming from who you really are. I've even shared this in this series that many people who, that were spying on him, they didn't really want to know Jesus. They just wanted to figure him out so they could report on him or, or get him killed or whatever else. They didn't really want to know him. And Jesus saw all through that. Can I tell you something? Jesus sees my heart. He sees everything in us. 
He, let me tell you what, what we think we can fool, hear me on this people, listen to me, what we think that we're fooling people with, we may fool people for a season. The Bible says everything's going to be exposed eventually. But it never fools God. And here's the greatness of our God that just broke my heart yesterday, praying and studying. In those moments of hypocrisy or religion that we find in ourselves that the Holy Spirit says, hey, let's deal with this, I am never rejected by my Father. He never kicks me to the curb and says, get yourself clean before you come before me. He actually says, come as you are. That's the greatness of our God. Now, he can't stand religion. He can't stand it in me or you or in his church. But he says, come. Somebody say, come. But see, we, we live in this world. Hannah was talking about it in regards with our children. But we live in this world that's all about society. It's all about image. Marketing. I, I read marketing stuff about business because I always want us to stay on top of what's going on in the world. Marketing, the two top words you hear a lot in marketing and business is branding and image. And appropriately so in the business world. I'm afraid we've let that message in the business world get on the church, though. And so, like, we're always worried about the image. And, and a, a big marketing slogan out there right now, over actually the last few years, is image is everything. If you don't have a good image and you don't have a good brand on your business, you're probably not going to do well and people won't know about you. And that thing, that message, business-wise, is appropriate but for us, it's very inappropriate because here we all know this. Image is not everything. You can have it all going on the outside and be dying on the inside. We're really good at putting on masks. We're really good at wearing a mask. I'll go there on the next one, part two, but we're really good at speaking Christianese. Now, listen. I, I'm going to speak the faith out of me all the time, but I think a lot of times, even with close friends, we're just, we don't go there because we're worried about being judged, and part of that is the church's fault. We're so critical and so judgmental. Someone said it a long time ago, we're the only organization that shoots their wounded, so no one ever tells them how they're really doing. The other, other part of it is we just, we don't want to let people know what's really going on inside of us. I, I, I was taught, not at the Bible college at least and I went to, but I was taught by uh, several men of God. One thing I did not agree with is they said, never, ever be real with your people. That was the old school thought of preaching. Don't ever let the people know where you're at. I feel like I'm the complete opposite. So, <laughs> but, uh, but that was an old school thought in the church is the leadership never lets the people know. Don't ever show a transparent moment. I think actually people are drawn to authenticity and transparency. People are, people are sick of fake and plastic, and we don't need that in the church. But listen to me, it can jump on any of us at any time. I'm just going to say this, there are marriages, and I'm not speaking just specifically here, but I'm telling you, there are marriages in the church that are on the last code blue moment, and no one knows because they're afraid to tell people. But I'm telling you, and you're missing... We're like, well, God knows, and He'll do it. Yes, God does know, and He can do anything, but God also works through His people. And there are great counselors and leaders and brothers and sisters and friends that can hold your arms up with your hurting. And I'm telling you, listen to me, don't allow pride, which attaches to religion, to stop you from being you and from sharing how you're really doing. If people judged you in the past, forgive them and move on. That doesn't mean, listen to me, that doesn't mean everybody's going to judge you. I, I'm, I'm tired of people saying, well, the church, well, you know what? No, actually, that was your church. That doesn't mean we're going to do that. Don't let that religious spirit get on you. Because I'm telling you, it can jump on real quick. Appearance. Are you with me? Jesus could care less about our appearance. He, he, that's all the religious leaders cared about was their appearance, how they looked. I'm, I just, you need to hear this. As I was praying through it yesterday, I needed to hear it. Jesus could care less about your appearance. 
You can look like you have it all together. And here's the thing that just was driving me home yesterday from the Holy Spirit. I'm afraid that there are many people in and outside the church who are dying on the inside, but they are determined at all costs not to let people know. They are determined to keep the facade going. That everything's okay. You know what? Let me just say this to you. Give somebody here permission. It's okay that everything's not okay at times. And it's okay to tell people that. Now listen, I don't tell everybody that, but like you, I have some trusted friends that I feel I can go to and not be judged. And I can tell them how I am. And, and I'm just a man. And, and, you know, and I'm a father. And I'm a husband. And I, my goal is to be a great husband. And my goal is to be a great father. And, and stuff gets in the way. And I want to be a great pastor. And You know, you need to tell people that. If you're married, you need to tell your spouse that, but you also, as a guy, need to tell some guys, and ladies, you need to tell some ladies. If you're a single, you need to tell the people. You need to tell someone, so they, re- this is what I always say, so I know how to really pray for you. I was telling a friend yesterday, we were talking on the phone about some things going on in their life, and I said, if you'll be more specific with me, I feel like right now I'm praying shotgun prayers, and yeah, shotgun's going to just get... You know, it just goes everywhere. But I want to pray laser-like prayers. I want to zone in on where you're at, and I want to hit that with you. And that's our God. He wants, and let me just tell you this. Somebody here would even think, well, God knows everything, so no, I'm not fooling. You already said it, Pastor Chris. That's right, but God wants to hear you tell on yourself. God wants to hear from your heart. Lord, I've been playing the game. Lord, would you forgive me for putting on a mask? Now hear me, there's even balance in that. Don't go to the extreme. We, we're so good at going to the extremes. Don't go to the extremes like, I'm never wearing a mask again, and I'm just going to let people know all the time, I'm just dying. I'm always dying. You know, people will stay away from me if you're just always drowning and dying, you know. So there's balance in that, but you need to have trusted. Somebody say trusted. Trusted friends that you can open up your, ta- your heart and chest to and say, would you help me with this? I think the problem is in society and in the church. By the way, society is not supposed to lead the church. The church is supposed to lead society. That's the problem today. Society has come in and said, this is the culture that you will be. And we have let it come in. No, we as a church, we're not any better than anybody, but we are supposed to be the leaders of society. And what we've done is we've taken a step back and the world said, okay, you're going to take a step back. I'm taking a step up. That's right. And so we've got to recognize and understand that. And so in society, everything is about image and appearance and all that stuff. And God is saying, no, I want your heart. I want your heart. Kyle Eidemann, out of the book this series is about, not a fan, he says this, some fans can put on an Oscar-worthy performance as they play the role of follower. This really hit me yesterday. Some fans have worn the mask so long they have even fooled themselves. What does the facade mean in these last few moments? Facade, I looked up in the dictionary, is a superficial, look at this definition, a superficial appearance or illusion of something. It's a facade. It's, it's not real. It's, it's putting up an appearance, an illusion. It's looking like we got it all together. Jesus Last two verses, 27 and 28, if you still have your Bible open. If you don't, it's right here on the screen. He says, woe to you, teachers of religious law and Pharisees. He says it again, you hypocrites. He's grieved over this. He's broken. But he's also sending judgment. That's what the second part of woe means. It is literally impending judgment. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Look at this. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. These are strong words. 
And it's words to the church today, capital C. It's words to us. Let me say this in closing. Christ is not looking for you and I to be perfect. But he is looking for us to be authentic and real. I want to try to lead that the best I can from this place publicly and also from my private life. I will not do it perfectly, neither will you. But our aim and goal is to chase the one who is continually, listen to me, perfecting us and making us more like himself. We have to submit. There's that word we don't like to hear a lot. We have to submit to the deep, penetrating work of the Holy Spirit to allow Him to dig in us and dig out of us all that stuff that is built up over years, especially if you've grown up in the church like I have. Again, it's just easier to play church than it is to be church. It really is. I, I just tell you, I'm, I'm not your judge. I don't, I don't, I'm, I've never been judgmental, actually. I'm, I'm not your judge. We, you're, you're, that's not your role either to judge anyone in this room or to judge people. We have a righteous judge. We need to let him. I say deal with it now, God, not later. De deal with it now. And this whole image is everything. It goes against the very word of God that says, come as you are. Come as you are. Well, I feel broken and I'm fragile and I feel like I'm falling apart. Well, go to the Lord. He, he says, come to me. Many of us have been rejected by a man before. It doesn't feel good. The Heavenly Father will never reject you. He'll never reject you. This whole thing of, of the image and everything else, we need to be a people that quit worrying about image and reputation and we put our whole focus, how about this, on the inside, character and integrity which is sadly missing today. I hear it all the time from entrepreneurs and bosses. They can't find the workforce that walks in character and integrity. But can I tell you what? It doesn't start with them. It starts with us. Can I tell you this? People are watching us more than you know. They're watching us. They're watching when you're at the cash register and that lady gives you or that man gives you extra cash. They see you in that moment. It's happened to me too many times, and all of a sudden I feel like eagle eyes staring at me. People are watching. You know what I think? Yes, there's a judgmental spirit out there, I know. But I also think people are looking for something real. They're looking to like see, like, does this whole thing line up? Because if it does, I want some of that. I mean, I'm hearing you talk about Jesus, and you're so kind to me as a boss, and you're, you're so kind as a neighbor. I, I, is this thing for real, for real? I think people want it. Everybody wants the real thing. I'm not talking about Pepsi or Coca-Cola slogan. The real thing. That's a fake. I'm talking about the real, authentic Jesus. Who desperately wants our hearts. Everything within us. I close out with a verse that we all know. Remember when Samuel went to go pick out David? Remember what the Lord said to him in a kind little rebuke? He looked at El Eliab, I think it was, the first one, and this is, what, this is what Samuel said. Oh, Lord, surely this beast of a man is the Lord's anointed. That's what he basically said. This man, he's got muscles, he looks the part, he, this is the Lord's anointed. And the Lord, look what the Lord said to Samuel. Don't judge by his appearance height for I've rejected him now, he wasn't talking about him as a son he was talking about him as king the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them look at this people judge by outward appearance say it with me but the Lord looks at the heart I love it one of my favorite verses and he's saying that to us today and listen you, you, you walk out these doors and you go about your life I myself I realize some of you bosses here, you don't have some of the greatest employees. I understand it's hard to keep. I understand it all. I hear it. I, my dad was an entrepreneur. I, I saw the struggles he went through. Neighbors, friends, all the, all the people we encounter that do not know Jesus. I want to say this to you. We are not their judge. 
And if they're lost, should you be surprised if they're doing lost things? They're lost. Instead of judging, let's love them into the kingdom. Let's lead them by our life. Not a perfect life, but by a life that hopefully looks like Jesus and a lot less like me. If the Lord tarries, that is what I would want on my tomb. It's been in my journal for years. That when people saw me, they would say, we saw Jesus. And that's the prayer for this church. Then when we're out there, whether we're blessing Northwest, which is kind of a big deal, you know, that's, that's big and public. But I, and God's into the big and public, He is, but He's also into the small, no one knowing. And just you stepping out, obeying God. Church, brothers, sisters, this is what the Holy Spirit said to me yesterday. And I say it to you. The Father says, I want your heart. The real you real you beat up angry ticked off discouraged joyful all the emotions he wants you fans always focus on the appearance followers of Jesus they just know I don't got to live up to some appearance I just want to live up to him I just want to follow him Paul said follow me as I follow the Lord. Let's pray.